before I kick things off, I will be talking about my expedition up to Hudson Bay tonight. I like to start off with a song. So I'm gonna sing a song and play guitar. I'm not a guitar player. I'm a saxophone player, but uh, this song, Across the Great Divide, has been a, a good friend of mine for many years. Well, I've been walking in my sleep. I've been counting troubles instead of counting sheep. Where the years went, I just can't say. I just turn around and they've gone away. And I've been sifting through the layers of dusty books. Faded papers, they tell a story that I used to know, one that happened so long ago, and it's gone away. sing that song on our trip. So I find it fitting to start out with that. So I'm going to take a second to share my screen. Give me a zoom moment. 
Let me, let me do that. Okay. Hello. Thank you again so much for coming. My name is Natalie Warren. I am the author of Hudson Bay Bound, Two Women, One Dog, 2,000 Miles to the Arctic. Uh, the book came out this February through the University of Minnesota Press. In 2011, a decade ago now, actually yesterday was a decade since Anne and I launched on the Minnesota River, we paddled from Minneapolis to Hudson Bay inspired by Eric Severide and Walter Port's route that Eric Severide documented in the classic book, Canoeing with the Cree. So here's what the book looks like. You can get it at your local bookstore. You can also get it anywhere online. Um, and I will be up in Grim Ray July 17th at Stone Harbor for a book signing and I would love to meet all of you. So I did not grow up in the wilderness. I'm from Miami, Florida. And when I was in high school, I went to an art school for saxophone performance. I struggled to keep up um, with the other people at my school. And I realized at some point I was not going to be the next John Coltrane or Charlie Parker. And I needed to figure out what else I liked to do because all I would do all day is play saxophone. And so a friend of mine told me, hey, I think you would like this place called the Boundary Waters. The youngest of three children, I marched home that day and dramatically declared to my mother that I would be spending the summer in the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. Growing up in Miami and also going to art school where geography was, was not a priority in the curriculum, the Midwest to me was just this gray blob. I had never thought about going there. I had never worn a flannel. I had never been on a farm. It seemed like a very, very distant place, but I needed to explore what I might be interested in. And so this seemed like it would be fun. I had never been camping before. I had never been canoeing before, but I signed up for a two week Boundary Waters trip through YMCA Camp Minogen when I was 15. I fell in love with the North Woods. It seemed like a different planet away from the palm trees and large ocean that I was used to living by. I zigzagged the canoe for days until I finally found my stride in the outdoors. My mom actually wrote me a note that I opened on trail on my first trip that read, I hope you're enjoying the beautiful mountains of Minnesota. And I remember thinking, no one knows where I am. But I was also still pretty foreign to the area, being as one night I heard wolves, wolves howling. And so I woke up all of my campmates and I told them there's a wolf pack coming. I'm really afraid for our safety. And they listened with me and it was the call of the loon, not a wolf howl. And so they thought that was funny, but I got to inform them that bagel is not bagel. And so we exchanged lots of cultural um, wisdom between the two of us in our different homes. I went on a progression of trips through YMCA Camp Minogen that culminated in the 50 day trip that I took in Nunavut, Canada, paddling with six other amazing women. We paddled the Kazan and Kunwak Inuit Heritage Rivers and more impactful than the thousands of migrating caribou that we saw or the musk oxen grazing lazily by these beautiful fast Arctic rivers was the woman who was assigned to be my paddling partner. Anne Reho. Anne, unlike me, grew up playing in the woods. She was an outdoors woman through and through, and so much of her I, I wanted to be. And so Anne and I, we were assigned paddling partners, and I remember on our first day on our Minogen trip, just making small talk, and she's like, well, where are you going to school in the fall? And I said, St. Olaf College. And she said, no way, me too. And so lo and behold, we ended up in the same freshman dorm. What this meant for us is that we spent the next four years plotting. 
whenever school was challenging, life was hard, family things, relationships, anything, we would end up in each other's dorm rooms, pouring over maps and always saying, what's next? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? And so senior year rolls around. And it's 2011. Um, the economy is still recovering after the 2008 recession. No one was really getting jobs. And so the prospect of moving back home was looking more and more probable as the year went on. Anne appeared in my door one day and she had a book in her hand. It was canoeing with the Cree and she threw it at me from across the room and said, read this. I think we should do it. And so that night I read Canoeing with the Cree cover to cover instead of writing a paper. And I went to her the next day and said, okay, let's do it. We were concerned about a lot of different things, but Anne and I just bounced positivity and hope off of each other. For example, we didn't even have a canoe, which is pretty necessary to do this trip. Uh, we also didn't have very much money. But within three months, we started telling people about what we wanted to do. We wanted to be the first two women to do this route that Eric Severide had made so popular. And the community came out of the woodworks to provide all of our gear and food. And we raised money to be able to cover a big portion of our trip. I didn't grow up uh, knowing about Anne Bancroft. I didn't grow up knowing about women who did these large, amazing expeditions, I never even thought it was an option for me because it was not a story that I had seen before. And so I didn't quite know the path ahead of us as we embarked on our journey. This story now that I look back, you know, a decade later, um, I hope tells a narrative that will inspire younger women, especially um, to see that this type of expedition is possible. That being said, we did face a lot of barriers, especially when getting sponsorships from people. And we even had people outright tell us that we couldn't make it. There was a guy that I talk about in the book who told us, he laughed at us when, he told, when we told him we were paddling to Hudson Bay. And he said, I bet you won't make it, or if you do, you won't make it until October. But when you make it, <laughs> if you make it, give me a call and I'll ship you a keg of Bud Light Lime. And he was actually the first person we called when we made it to Hudson Bay, and he didn't even remember who we were. And so Anne and I embarked on a journey breaking into an industry that is still largely made for white males, um, the outdoor industry in terms of sponsorship and media coverage and all of these things. And we faced some challenges, but we overcame them and felt very lucky to be able to be the first two women and hopefully not the last two women to do this route. This is our route in a nutshell. I'll give you a quick overview and then talk about each section individually. So we left from Fort Snelling State Park and went upstream for the first 330 miles on the Minnesota River. And then we had a couple small lakes and we were on the Boise de Sioux River which is a very channelized river that when it meets up with the otter tail turns into the Red River of the North that borders Minnesota and the Dakotas going across the border into Canada through Winnipeg. And then we paddled the east shore of Lake Winnipeg, 280 miles up the east shore until we got to the Nelson River, which we were on very briefly before meeting up with the Etchamamish River, which connects the Nelson to the Hayes River. So if you're familiar with canoeing the Cree, uh, Eric Severide and Walter Port took the Gods River at this point. We took the Hayes River out to York Factory on Hudson Bay. We left on June 2nd, 2011, during the 2011 flood. We meant to leave from Pike Island, but it was underwater. So here we are leaving at a random inlet at Fort Snelling State Park, looking at the strong current in front of us, the river cresting at over 20 feet above its normal level and the water rushing. I remember at this moment thinking if we get sideswept, we're just gonna paddle the Mississippi instead, 
But here we go, turning the corner, paddling upstream at a speedy 1.5 miles per hour for 330 miles. Paddling about 12 to 15 miles a day um, in, on a full day's paddle. Before we left on this expedition, people told us that the Minnesota River is the river of chocolate milk. It's not a recreational river, it's a polluted agricultural river, and it was unfortunate that we had to paddle it as a part of the route we were doing. We had very low expectations for the Minnesota River. On our first day, we were paddling through a wildlife, a national wildlife refuge, and otters came and swam by our boat to wish us good luck on our journey. Where we left from, uh, Bedote, where the confluence of the Minnesota River and Mississippi River is, the center of the universe for the Dakota people, and we were traveling through stolen land for the majority of this trip. Anne and I found the river to be an absolute gem. The vegetation was full of bird songs throughout the day and the sun would shine on the leaves that would dance in the wind. And we didn't encounter too many other people on the river. That being said, it is a polluted agricultural river. I was an environmental studies major in my undergrad and I felt like, you know, I had talked and read a lot about the environment and here I was sort of dropped in it for the first time um, in terms of you know people really interacting with the land and I learned all about buffer zones and agricultural policy and I was just baffled as we paddled the river to see cornfields going directly into the water the water going over the fields. And so it's not just that the runoff from these large industrial farms eventually makes its way to the river, it goes directly into the river, the nitrogen and the phosphorus and all of these harmful chemicals that we put on larger conventional agricultural fields flow into the Minnesota River, flow into the Mississippi River, and contribute to the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, where this excess nitrogen causes algal blooms that deplete oxygen and don't allow for aquatic life to thrive. I felt pretty upset. Uh, about this, but because the river was flooded, we couldn't just camp on shore. We ended up having to knock on farmers' doors and they would let us camp on their fields, but they would also invite us over for dinner. And I, before we knew it, we were sitting face to face with people having these really candid conversations about um, agricultural practices. And we were hearing from them, you know, they get paid based on yield. They need to grow as much as possible because they're in debt and they need to send their kids to school. And so, you know, they need to grow as close to the river as they can. And we expressed our frustrations with what was happening. I think I felt more frustrated the more I paddled the river. Um, the, the river became our home. It became our friend. Uh, we saw the Minnesota River River at its best and at its worst on beautiful sunny days where we were able to paddle easily upstream and then days where lightning and rain and wind came all around us. And as the river became our friend, these things that we see that are so normalized, the way that we harm the river and grow food in a way that directly pollutes our water resources started to become stranger and stranger to me. We passed large tubes, drainage tiles um, in which this is a totally normal practice for large agricultural fields. The rain used to fall and sink into the ground. It used to recharge the groundwater system. And now it basically is on a speed train out to the river as it hits the ground to make sure that the fields don't get flooded. What this does though, is it causes the Minnesota River currently has more water in it than it has in recent history. All of the water is rushed to the main channel and this erodes the banks of the river. The sediment goes into the water and settles downstream. Someone else's problem to be sure. 
The high waters, which happen more and more frequently these days, don't allow for vegetation to take hold on the shores of the river. We would paddle by the shore to be out of the strong current and hear large cracking sounds in the woods until one by one trees would just fall into the water and float downstream. Anne and I had been on these beautiful wilderness canoe expeditions, but this was the first time where we actually had to confront our human impact on the world. Places like energy plants are located out of sight for a reason, but when you paddle places like the Minnesota River, the Mississippi River, the Red River, you start to th see things that are hidden from the human eye. We were able to feel the temperature of the water before and after energy plants and understand that even if the water is cleaned after it is used, it still drastically makes impacts on the natural ecosystem. We confronted dams which constantly reminded us that the river was not made for us to travel. This dam has actually since been removed and it is now a class three rapid set. Not only does it inhibit paddlers from moving freely throughout the river, but it separates the river in ways that fish that used to flow through hundreds of miles now are segmented into specific areas of the river without being able to flow freely in their natural habitat. This is a picture of Ann and I approaching the Granite Falls Dam. Now paddling upstream to a dam, the current is a lot stronger, as you can see by the water coming up in the bow of our boat in this picture. So we're paddling as hard as we can. And eventually I look up and I look and I see there's a tree and the tree trunk is not moving. And we're essentially on a river treadmill, not moving forward. And so Anne and I agree we should pull to the side, portage or carry all of our gear and our canoe to the other side of the dam and put back in where the current was less strong. Right when we agreed to do this, however, two journalists from the local paper jumped out of the bushes and started taking pictures of us and saying, you can do it, you can paddle all the way to the dam. And so we couldn't pull over at that point, we had something to prove. And so Anne and I paddled what was a ridiculously long, uh, you know, 45 minutes to go less than half a mile. And as we were doing this, the community started to trickle out to the banks of the river cheering us on. And when we finally got to the takeout, the mayor met us and shook our hand and said excitedly, we've never even seen two guys do that before. And I remember thinking, why would anyone do that? But we continued on our way and eventually we were able to paddle downstream at last. We paddled the Bois de Sioux River, which met up with the Otter Tail River at Wapiton, and here we are, the headwaters of the Red River of the North. So if we were paddling 12 to 15 miles a day, paddling all day on the Minnesota River, Anne and I were now paddling 50 to 60 miles a day, cruising downstream. We came across this monument along the river, five empty tractor seats to represent the disappearance of the family farm. You used to need an entire community to grow food and provide food uh, for people, but now with the advancement in agricultural technology, you only really need one, maybe two people to farm thousands of acres of land. And this does more than just pull people away from their homes and the land, the small towns along the Red River and the Minnesota River are experiencing decreasing populations as people no longer need to live there. We kept hearing the same story when people showed us around. It was this place used to be really cool as we looked at boarded up shops as the nearby Walmart had just opened. Anne and I had a lot of time when we were canoeing. Canoeing is very meditative. It's great for people who like to be on the go, but also still at the same time. And we were able to discuss what it would look like, the resurgence of small town America around good food and clean water and recreation and interconnected trails beyond just the sole industry of large agriculture. 
we loved paddling from town to town and we thought other people might too. We saw a lot of dilapidated buildings and this just was an eerie experience that reminded us again of once was what once was as we met old men getting older alone on their farms with no one to take over. But I don't want to paint a dreary picture of the, the Red River Valley. We did stay with communities that were so vibrant that it brought us to our knees as urbanites. We stayed with this group um, from the International Water Institute and they threw a barbecue for us in Climax, Minnesota. As we were talking to people, everyone kept telling us the same story. They said there was a woman from the neighboring town of Fertile who was murdered in their community. And the next morning, the newspaper title said, Fertile Woman Dies in Climax. I'm very sorry for telling that joke, but not really. So on the Red River, we had to cross the border into Canada. And Anne is very good at details and logistics. We made an amazing duo for this trip. She had already contacted the border station, told them what we were doing, and they agreed to meet us by the river. That being said, we still weren't quite sure what to expect. And so we launched in the morning like any other day. And around 9 a.m. we turn a corner and we see a bridge with two huge black SUVs on top. And when they see us, they turn their sirens on and they come down to the riverbank. Now the Red River is a muddy river, especially during a flood. Anne and I were caked in Red River mud for about a month. And so six border agents came out in their clean uniforms and shiny black boots and watched us try to get to shore. Our canoe got stuck in mud, we hopped out, we were trying to do our quick feet so that we didn't sink into the mud, and eventually we made it over there. They looked at us and they looked at the mud in between them and our canoe and they looked at our boat and said, yeah, we're not going to go over there, so why don't you just go grab your gun and we'll take you to the station to sign a waiver for it. We had brought a gun with us for extra protection in polar bear country. Actually, before we left, Lonnie Dupree up in Grand Marais um, told us all about polar bear safety and what we might encounter. But really, I think we brought a gun to make our moms feel just a little bit better about our own safety. So Anne went with some of the border agents to the station to sign a waiver. And I was on the shore with these border agents just making small conversation. I pride myself in having fairly good social skills, but I remember this being a pretty challenging situation of lots of questions and dead end conversations. I was wondering what was, what was taking Anne so long? And Anne gets really red when she's nervous and it was a hot July day and she was still wearing her life jacket and apparently she turned bright red and started sweating and so they questioned her for acting suspiciously but eventually she came back and we took off into Canada. Canada to us meant one thing at this point, poutine, french fries covered in gravy and cheese curds. We were burning thousands of calories a day and our granola bar snacks just weren't really cutting it at this point in our trip. And so we stopped in the first small town that we saw. We walked up in our muck boots and we opened the door to this bar and we look inside and say, do you all have poutine? And the bartender stops what he's doing and he looks up at us and says, we have the best poutine in Manitoba. We're like, all right. And so after some carbo loading, Anne and I decided, and this is the beauty of paddling with just one other person and having a great team, we decided that we wanted to paddle 100 miles overnight so that we could get to Winnipeg. We knew there was a full moon that night. We knew there were no more obstacles in our way, or so we thought. Um, before we get to Winnipeg, where Anne's parents were meeting us with our second food drop, we carried a month of food at a time, and we knew we would stay in a hotel room and get to sleep in beds. So we were ready to push it to Winnipeg. And this is around 11 p.m. at night. 
when the moon came out, this is around 1 a.m., Anne and I started to feel a little bit sleepy. We had about a two hour repertoire of music that we would sing on our expedition. And so we were singing Cat Stevens' Moon Shadow, but we only knew the first verse. So we just kept singing that over and over and over again until we went crazy and started singing other things. But we really liked the idea that as we paddled through a suburban area south of Winnipeg during the summer that people had their windows open and they could hear river sirens singing through the night. Light started to show in the sky around 4.30 a.m. And we got to paddle toward this beautiful sunrise. At this point, this is around 5 a.m. We could calculate we're going five, six miles an hour. We'll be in Winnipeg by 7 a.m. As if you just arrive in a very large metro area. Well, 7 a.m. rolls around and we see this large sign on the river that just says danger really big. No one's around. We haven't seen that many buildings, but we just come across this danger sign, clearly meant for us. And I'm a little bit more laissez-faire. I'm like, oh, that's interesting, do do do. But Anne needed to figure this out. And so we pulled over and I lay back in the canoe looking up at the blue sky, listening to Anne on her phone, frantically calling authority figures in Winnipeg, telling them about this sign and asking if they know what it was and over and over, no one knew what this, what she was talking about. And so she came back defeated, said, well, let's just keep going. Well, we turn the corner and what we see is this huge dam with rushing white water at the bottom and a control tower at top. And they had opened up the floodgates around Winnipeg. And so now we were getting pushed toward this large infrastructure. And as you well know, every time this infrastructure is built, there are paddlers at the table who request portage paths around these things on rivers that are clearly meant for recreation. No, what we found was nothing but boulders on either side, all the way up to the road and the same on the way down. And so after not sleeping for 24 hours, we did about a three hour portage in which we had to triple back or carry things three different trips. And on that last time we were going over the road, a guy came out of the control tower holding a nice cup of coffee, looking very relaxed, basically the last person you want to see when you're upset and tired. And he said, hey, ladies, where are you going? And we're like, we're going to Hudson Bay. It's like, oh, cool. And we're walking away and I just see Anne stop and turn around and start yelling, did you put that sign out there? Cause you need to put a number on that. Meanwhile, I'm dragging her down saying, thanks for letting us portage your dam. But we finally arrived in Winnipeg. This is near where the Assiniboine River flows into the Red River. And you can see it was still very flooded. People in Winnipeg, people in Fargo still talk about the 2011 flood in which we were paddling. We got to sleep in a hotel. I was slowly convincing Anne over the course of two weeks, which I had the luxury of doing on this trip, to that we should watch Harry Potter while we're there because we'd have to wait a month and a half before we were able to see it. She didn't love the idea, but uh, we were able to go to the movie theater and watch Harry Potter, which was a bizarre experience after just looking at green, blue, and brown colors for so long. And I think we were the smelliest people in the theater. But then we had to continue on our journey. The next leg of our trip, paddling Lake Winnipeg. This picture says it all. Lake Winnipeg is the 11th largest lake in the world in terms of surface area. It's a very shallow lake. When the wind blows, the waves pick up quickly and it, it can become dangerous, very dangerous to paddle. We had heard horror stories of paddling Lake Winnipeg. People begged us not to paddle it. Even Eric Severide and Walter Port got a tow for the second half of Lake Winnipeg. But when we got there, it was glass, just completely flat. You couldn't see where the water ended and the sky began. And so we thought, ah, what's everyone talking about? 
Well, we were sure to find out, as you well know, if you're familiar with Lake Superior, things change quickly. But we were able finally to paddle into this vast expanse of water out of the riverbank that we had been used to. We got to watch the sun sink into itself every night. And at this part of the trip, we started to enter a more rugged wilderness. We were doing a night paddle one night. Um, the wind isn't as strong at night. And so sometimes we would try to do these night paddles to make up more ground when it was windy during the day. But something felt weird. The moon wasn't out. The air was very thick. And Anne and I, our instincts told us to pull over. Right after we did, a huge lightning storm came through. The sky was orange and we watched lightning strike across the lake. We finally were going to sleep that night and I looked up and I saw two huge paws of a black bear pushing down on the top of our tent. And so I jumped to the other side of the tent and I said, Anne, get the foghorn. Her mom had prepared us in every way possible. Pam Rejo is uh, absolutely amazing. And she gave us a tiny foghorn for the sole purpose of scaring away black bears, which we honestly thought was a joke. Uh, we would you know, make fun of the foghorn for so much of the trip. Yet here we were in the middle of a storm, in the middle of, a night, of the night, rummaging around in our gear for this foghorn and Anne finally finds it and she goes to push it and it just goes it had gotten wet at some point um, but it's a black bear you know we knew what to do we ran out of the tent and we looked big and we made loud sounds and it ran into the dark woods well the storm continued to pick up and the wind picked up so much that the corners of our tent started to lift. And so soon enough, Anne and I were dissembling our tent and following that black bear into the woods to sit in lightning position on our life jackets while we waited for the storm to pass. The next morning, it was still too windy to paddle. We were, make, we were having a leisurely breakfast and Anne grabs the foghorn and is like, I can't believe this thing didn't work last night. And she pushes it right next to my face and it goes Bruh. a little too late. We would watch huge sis uh, weather systems come toward us and we'd paddle for as long as we could before we pulled over and waited them out. We were windbound a total of seven days. And on one of those days, we were making breakfast and a snake comes by. And I am sad to say I overreacted, uh, but Anne scared the snake away. And as we continue to eat, another snake comes by and then another snake comes by. And we look in the um, twigs that had pushed and the branches that had pushed up on shore, the driftwood, and intermingled were a bunch of snakes. So fun fact, Manitoba has the highest snake population in the world at the Narcissa snake dens where snakes overwinter in huge limestone cracks. And we were not even a hundred miles away from that location. And so we packed up all of our gear as fast as possible without saying anything and then realized, oh wait, the waves are too big. We can't actually go anywhere. So we just sort of pulled our thing Things around the corner throughout the day and camped a little bit further away from the snakes. We were windbound for three days in a row once. And I remember the first day we were just so happy to be able to catch up on sleep. We had been paddling a lot at night and it was nice to be able to just catch up on our rest. The second day we started to feel a little bit more frustrated that we couldn't move. It's not often in our lives that nature, uh, the wind, the rain, even a massive snowstorm keeps us from going somewhere where we want to go. And here we were sort of trapped on this small beach with the lake on one side and a berm and swamp on the other side. But that third day we woke up and we didn't have the expectation to paddle. And we ended up just spending the day on this short stretch of beach. I tried to whittle a recorder out of a stick for eight hours and it for sure didn't work, but I somehow was enthralled and enchanted by the activity while Anne was making sand art and collecting stones by the shore. 
Finally, we were able to depart. A couple days later, we were doing a night paddle and Anne and I got along really, really well for two people being always within sight of each other for a hundred days. But I think to, to summarize our conflict, sometimes I was a little bit too carefree about things and Anne I thought was a little bit too anxious about things. And this really does make a good duo when it is in balance. But we were doing a night paddle on Lake Winnipeg and the lake was completely flat. All the stars were out in the Milky Way and it was reflecting on the surface of the lake. So it looked like we were paddling through space. And then I was in the stern and I was pointing the bow a little bit further away from shore than Anne had liked. And this one act of a canoe bow pointed too far to the left is what made us crack. It was our tipping point. Anne started talking about her frustrations. I was venting my frustrations. One by one, we were pulling the weeds in our relationship, but we reached a point where we were no longer talking to each other. During this time, the Northern Lights started to come out. They started as a small green orb and then expanded to these large strings uh, with pink and purple and green dancing all around us in the middle of the night on the 11th largest lake in the world. And I remember I so desperately wanted to tell Anne, this is the most beautiful thing I have ever seen, but I wasn't talking to her. And so the only thing we said to each other that night, I was worried now I was overcompensating and we were too close to shore. So I asked Anne if she could shine her headlamp, which was much brighter than mine, toward shore to see, you know, to gauge how far away we were. And so she did, and what we saw was the same green light in the sky, but in the eyes of a bull moose, not a hundred yards away from us, staring back at us in the night. We eventually pulled over and camped, and Ann and I, while we were next to each other in the tent, wrote each other letters about how we felt, about how we were more of a sisterhood than a friendship, and conflict and fighting should be a normal part of any relationship. And we, our relationship only got better and better after that argument. On Lake Winnipeg, and especially in the North Basin, we paddled over large algal blooms caused directly from the agricultural runoff on the Red River. These smelly green carpets that have devastated the fishing industry on Lake Winnipeg in which you can actually see the algal blooms from space. It was so interesting to paddle with the water as if we were a water molecule going through its journey and seeing and experiencing and smelling all of the sensations and uh, feelings of these interconnected systems that you don't always get to see when you look at issues in silos. So we made it to the end of Lake Winnipeg, and when we saw the mouth, mouth of the Nelson River, we bawled. We didn't cry when we made it to Hudson Bay, but there was something about finishing Lake Winnipeg that really brought us immense joy. We stayed at Norway House Cree First Nation um, with the Mushwagen family, and we got there just in time for York Boat Days. It's a huge annual festival in which everyone is out cooking food on the streets and playing music. And the big event is that they race these York boats. Uh, so York Factory, where we were going, is where Hudson Bay Company built York boats um, to traverse these, these waterways. And so um, the winner of the race actually gets $10,000. And for a community that 85% of their people are on welfare. This is like the event. However, we learned more and more about what was happening. And apparently this ev event was made by the government to celebrate the day that their lands were flooded and everyone lines up during this event to collect their $5 as somehow just compensation for being torn from their lands, from a way of knowing, from a language, from a relationship and understanding of nature that connects people in mutually thriving and life supportive ways with the rest of the world and forced into a community, forced to assimilate um, to a colonial capitalist ideology. We got to stay up late 
with Mike and Janice in their home and they told us of all of these, you know, things and injustices that were going on in their community, their access to food, for example, the one grocery store in Norway House was outposted from Winnipeg. And so the money didn't even flow back into their local economy. And things like milk and cheese were so expensive. And so a lot of people were living off of sodas and processed foods and experiencing diabetes and health issues that were not prevalent in their communities before. They also had a stray dog problem. And Mike was telling us they don't have a humane society. So in the winter, the dogs actually pack up and attack people. And he was talking to us about this and said, you know, ladies, I've been thinking about it. And I think you should take a dog. I think you should take a dog with you because if a polar bear comes, it'll eat your dog and you'll have time to load your gun. Anne was 21, I was 22, we didn't live anywhere and getting a dog is a big decision, but you know, we were sort of concerned about going into polar bear country. And the next day we were walking around looking at all the stray dogs sort of in a new light as if we were window shopping. And that night we drove around and we saw the silhouette of a dog about this big, licking ketchup packets off the ground outside of the movie theater parking lot. And I just knew she was the one. And so I ran out of the car and I grabbed her and this is my Han. My Han, my he Han in Cree means wolf and Mike and Janice gave us their blessing to name her my Han. We'd like to think that she was part wolf and we put her in the canoe the next morning. It turns out she's afraid of water would, which actually worked out pretty well. She would stay in the boat throughout the day and then at night she would run around and hunt. Anne and I had already talked about everything that you could possibly imagine, even the fact that we had already talked about everything you could possibly talk about. And so our lives were just injected with this adorable fluffy thing all of a sudden. Anne's mom liked to joke at the time that we knew what it was like to be married with a kid. My Han was a lovely addition for the rest of our expedition. Um, and Anne ended up taking her after the trip and she is still alive today. We finally got to the Hayes River, this beautiful Arctic river in which the water is able to seep into the ground, expand into the landscape, landscape and do its responsibility to creation, which is flow and provide a resource to sentient beings. And Anne and I, after paddling the Minnesota River, the Red River, and even Lake Winnipeg, in which we had to fill jugs of water at a time, uh, just to drink water and cook food, Anne and I were able to drink directly from the Hayes River, which is a beautiful experience that I'm not sure that my daughter will ever have. We were able to, on the Hayes River, compare it to those other places that we had been, see that it was relatively untouched. And it helped us to think of what rivers once were, of what we have already lost, and of what could potentially come back with new ways of living in the world. Playfulness came back to our relationship as we maneuvered the tricky white water sets on the Hayes River. I have um, a journal entry that I would love to read for you, sort of paired with a, a video with some clips from the end of our trip. And to provide you some visuals, uh, this is Oh gosh, White Mud Falls, there we go. <laughs> White Mud Falls, which I will reference in my journal entry is the last rapid set on the Hayes River before 200 kilometers to Hudson Bay. And this is as you go from the forest to the taiga where the trees get shorter and shorter as you get nearer and nearer to the tundra, we saw a lot of these white mud cliffs along the riverbank, which I reference in my journal entry as well. Here we are on the Etchamamish, which, as I mentioned before, connected the Nelson River to the Hayes River. And we encountered a 
a lot of beaver lodges like this, as you can see. And so we would have to pull our canoe up and over and drag across a pile of sticks. And one time I was doing this and I stepped out of the boat just to drag the boat over. And when I brought my feet back inside, I had 55 leeches, uh, you know, hitching a ride on my feet. But now I am not afraid of leeches. So that was a character building experience for me. Here's my Han wondering what her new life is all about. Turns out she was only six months when we picked her up. So she's just a little puppy. The Etchamamish was the buggiest part of our trip. As you can see, it's got sort of a swampy vibe to it. So on the Hayes River, we would crash camp wherever we could find. Uh, we had to move a fallen tree to set up this campsite. And I'm gonna turn on the audio just so you can see, we're starting to get a little loopy. There she is, cooking away. Welcome to the kitchen. And uh, today we're making biscuits in the pot. <laughs> 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 What did the dog think of that? My Han, say hello to the GoPro! Yay! And this is me. Um, it, it's J84. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we enjoyed having My Han around for our few portages. It's amazing how the water is connected for these 2,000 miles. Um, we would get to a path and see fresh bear scat, but Maihan would run the trail back and forth, alerting any wildlife of our presence before we embarked. And you can see on this path, it's not very well maintained as you, as you can imagine. And we were carrying, you know, 50, 60 pound packs over things like this, um, logs over these sort of rock crevices. I'm going to read the journal entry that I wrote actually when we got to York Factory that night, I remember writing this, this journal entry and it turned into sort of the inspiration for the end of my book. We ran several rapids until we reached White Mud Falls, our last set, portage, anything. I felt very emotional because I knew that after this portage, there was nothing that could stop us from making it to York Factory. The last few days brought emotional and physical challenges that left us exhausted and sore. After almost three months on trail, we were finally ready to end our trip. I felt a lack of nutrition had worn on my health and I couldn't wait until I could eat fruits and vegetables again. While the hope of York factory and relaxation was at our fingertips, we still had 200 kilometers to go on the river and the rumors of polar bear country echoing in our minds. We paddled hard. Endurance and longevity are our strengths, and we plan to make the four-day trip from White Mud to York Factory in a mere two days. Our day lasted 15 hours before the sun made us retire to the shore. The moon did not show as we built our first fire to fight the cold. We plan to stay up all night but after an hour, we felt the weight of our exhaustion and gave in to the comfort of our tent and sleeping bags. Ironically for Anne, it was one of her best nights of sleep despite our anxiety in polar bear country. I slept, but I dreamt of creatures surrounding the tent and felt a deep sorrow that we would never actually make it to the end. We left camp that morning without breakfast and continued on the flowing haze. We heard stories of a thick fog and dark clouds typical to this section of the river, but we had a clear morning. We approached the turn where the God's River joins the haze, and we saw our first woodland caribou swimming across the river. The current quickened at the conjunction, and we had a floating breakfast of cold quinoa and chili powder from the night before. We continued on our way. With 10 more hours of paddling ahead, we felt as far away from York Factory as we ever had. Our wrists ached, hands clenched, and minds more than anything were on the verge of insanity. The river was beautiful. 
There were high white mud cliffs on the right and low-lying spruces on the left, decorating the shoreline, always reminding us of our desolation. Our strokes slowed and stomachs turned and we became desperate for the hours to pass. All of a sudden from behind us, we heard a huge clap of thunder that spooked us both. Just then a pack of wolves, five total, one black, came out to the riverbank from behind the spruce. The air was still, there was a suspicious calm. The wolves stopped in their tracks when they felt our presence. We stared, they stared. My Han barked. A bird made a loud cry and the sound brought goosebumps to our skin. We glanced at the dark cloud floating behind us and we were off with the motivation reminiscent of our efforts on the Red River. We reached the rock, a big rock on the river bank that signified a remaining distance of 50 kilometers, 40 kilometers, 30 kilometers, two more hours. We sang every song we knew, including some Christmas medleys. We saw seals, caribou, a black bear, every white rock looked as if it were swimming our way. And I joked that someone should spray paint them all black to soothe the nerves of canoeists on the haze. We were 10 kilometers away. We were hungry, tired, and desperate. It felt as though something could still go wrong, a storm or a bear. Could we really just arrive unscathed at York Factory? We passed the point where the tide effect would slow us down, but we were moving steadily toward the bay. We turned left and there it was. Hudson Bay. Overwhelmed with hunger, we did not joyously celebrate the sight of the bay, but solemnly paddled toward it. I didn't know what to say to Anne, and I wasn't quite sure how I felt. These last few days have been some of the most trying days of my life, and I knew I could relax now, but I felt an emptiness as well. This has been my lifestyle for 85 days, and there was no party or trophy at the end, just a set of stairs leading up to a building that once manufactured York boats. How was this a major destination for canoeists? Who made the bay into a rite of passage? The history is interesting and we were in awe at the expanse of water, but what made our voyage so significant and important to others? I do not yet understand the magnitude of our adventure and the importance of being the first two women to complete it. I'm sure I will reflect on these questions for years to come. So we made it to York Factory and uh, I had a manual camera that the film was developed inverted. So sorry, this is a little backwards. We made it to York Factory. We climbed an old rickety wooden set of stairs and we took the caretakers by surprise. There were three of them there for the season. And they said, it's a good thing that you're here because the season is ending two weeks early and we're all leaving tomorrow. At this after we had paddled 200 kilometers in two days. But if no one was there, we would have just set up camp. We had a satellite phone to call our float plane. It would have been fine. However, as we were making food along the shore because we were so hungry, uh, we wanted to get there so badly that we didn't want to stop paddling to eat food because it seemed like a waste of productive paddling time. And so we plopped all of our gear down. We started cooking up the rest of the food as the caretaker stood over us with his gun, which I thought was a little much until we saw a polar bear come around the bend. Um, it was a young polar bear, sort of just meandering along the shore. And Anne and I were completely shocked. Apparently the caretaker sees this all the time. And we looked up at him and we're like, we're ready to go inside. So we were able to go into the caretaker's home, uh, which is the house across from this big, large York factory white building and watch the polar bear from indoors. The caretakers told us that this used to be a community of over 300 people. In 1930, when Eric Severide and Walter Port got here, they went to church. Um, now it's a historic site and only caretaker, you can only get there by boat or by plane and they have a couple caretakers there and scientists come to study the melting permafrost from the effects of climate change. So you can see this eroded bank here as the haze flows into Hudson Bay. 
That bank erodes eight meters a year. They've actually had to move that York factory building three times because its original location would be underwater. And here they are experiencing the brunt of a warming planet. Anne and I were able to brand our paddles with the YF York factory symbol that was used by the Hudson Bay Company on their boats. I remember that night we were sleeping in a little cabin and I was just so happy to be able to catch up on rest. I was feeling really worn out and tired. The last couple of days had been rainy. Our toothbrushes were molding. It was just, you know, time to get back to life, I think, at that point. And Anne woke me up super early and she's like, Natalie, you got to see this. I'm like, oh, okay. So I climbed down from this bunk bed and we push this heavy metal door out. And as the sun is coming up, we see the polar bear running on the boardwalk the caretaker's large German shepherd chasing the polar bear and Liam, the caretaker on an ATV chasing that. And they're all moving at about the same speed on this boardwalk. And I remember looking over at Anne and saying, I think it's time to go home. And so we took a float plane to Gillam, Manitoba, a 35 hour train ride back to Winnipeg where our friends picked us up to take us across the border and back to the end of the Gunflint Trail where Anne's parents have a cabin, the only blue roof in Cook County. And Anne, as we were filling the van with our, all of our gear at the train station, Anne remembered that our gun was still loaded. And I was like, well, you know, take the bullets out. And I just, look back and it is rush hour, people are leaving work, it's busy city, urban area, and Anne is just pumping a shotgun. And I remember thinking like, I, I feel like this is weird, but I've been gone from society long enough where I'm not quite sure. And so we got to the border, Megan, our friend from camp, gave the border agent our passports and she said, well, where have you been? And Megan goes, well, these ladies just paddled to Hudson Bay. And she's like, well, no shit, go on ahead. And we're like, well, we got a dog and we have this gun. And she's like, oh, that, that sounds awesome. And she also did her job very well. But crossing the border back into the US was a little less difficult than we had originally imagined. So we got to Anne's cabin, at the end of the Gunflint Trail, and we mostly just sat outside for two weeks trying to reflect on what we had just done. This expedition was a coming of age journey that became so much more than just two strong women exploring the wilderness. The scars on the landscape unfolded before our eyes as we paddled north. The harm done by industry and agriculture and the injustices done to First Nation communities were impossible to ignore as we moved with the land and water. I can still feel those visceral moments of standing in a cornfield and being in a food desert, meeting farmers who could barely feed themselves, paddling over toxic algal blooms on Lake Winnipeg caused by agricultural runoff, and watching a First Nation community line up to receive their annual $5 from the government as compensation for stolen land and generations of injustice. These moments impacted how I perceive the world around me today. We were worried that living in a canoe for three months would be a huge gap in our resumes when in fact, this expedition launched our careers and molded us into the women that we are today. Paddling with the water opened our eyes to complex interconnected relationships at play in and around us and the importance of caring for the delicate balance of all life. When I need reminding that we must go out into the world, no matter how scary it might seem, and despite how comfortable we are in our homes and routines, I read this poem by Robert Bly. What? You want to live your life over again? Well, I suppose, yes, that time in Grand Rapids, my life as I lived it was a series of shynesses. Being bolder, what good would that do? I'd open my door again. I felt abashed, you see. Now I'd go out and say, all right, I'll go with you to Alaska. 
Just opening the door from inside would have altered me a little. I'm too shy. And so a bolder life is what you want. We could begin now. Just walk with me down to the river. I'll pretend this boat is my life. I'll climb in. Thank you so much for having me speak um, with you all tonight. And uh, if you were, if you want to see our trip blogs or read more about the book, you can go to my website, nataliewarren.com. You can follow me on Instagram at nwarrenwrites. Um, and this is my email. If you have any questions, I encourage you to buy the book from your local bookstore. But if uh, you're in the Twin Cities, Majors and Quinn is a, a great spot that I enjoy. So thank you all so much for listening to my story. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us. That was a really inspiring story. And uh, yeah, what an adventure to go on. Um, I'm hoping that you're willing to take a couple of questions. Great, mm -hmm. if folks have questions for Natalie, you can drop them into the chat or that Q&A button I talked about earlier. That would be wonderful. So what's your next adventure? That's always a good question. Yeah, that is. Um, so I should maybe, after that trip, I paddled the length of the Mississippi. Um, I did the Yukon River Quest, which you mentioned in the introduction. And I wrote a book, which was a journey on its own. And I actually just had a baby, which is a whole nother journey. Um, and, you know, we were talking about this before, but I have to take shorter expeditions now. And by that, it's, you know, I'm, I live near the Mississippi River, so I'm out paddling there as much as possible and just taking those, those short moments to reconnect. But as my responsibilities have grown throughout the last decade, it's, it'd be much more challenging to leave for three months these days than perhaps it was when I was when I was 22. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see myself as an expeditioner per se. I, I actually think what I did is totally normal and everyone should do it. Um, it's really just an experience to get to know not only yourself, but but the land and, and human relationships with it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that is a there's no really amazing answer to come. <laughs> That's a great answer. Yeah. Let's see a couple of questions coming in. Um, can you talk a little bit about navigation and what you used? Yeah, so we, uh, for the Minnesota River and the Red River, there are really good just sort of state water trail maps that we used and campsites along the way. But again, everything was flooded, so that's all out the window. Um, on Lake Winnipeg, we used very detailed maps and i remember we ran into a kayaker that was literally just using like a road map that you pick up at a gas station it was like here's the lake <laughs> like oh so interesting and then when we were paddling whitewater we were using the hap wilson maps and that details a lot of the the whitewater sets um you know where the obstacles are and so we were able to sort of have that beta as we went onto those faster rivers Great. Uh, let's see. Uh, can you highlight any gear that you, was um, both surprisingly useful, besides the foghorn, <laughs> and um, things that you brought that maybe were really not useful? Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's a, huff, a tough one. I think our favorite item, and this is still my favorite item to this day, is this large plastic uh, French press coffee mug. And we would just use it every single day. We'd make coffee once, two times a day, and that would just sort of float around our boat. And that it was really, really perfect for us to be able to make the coffee in the vessel in which we actually drank it from, which um, maybe is not a specific gear per se. Important though. Very important. It was very important. And our bare barrel was fabulous. Actually, when we were paddling whitewater, my hunt always ended up at the very top of the bare barrel and just tip the boat was so tippy when she was up there and anything. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's it's anything that keeps your stuff dry successfully is always my favorite item on an expedition or any canoe trip. So really, really good. I think we had sea line dry bags that worked really well for us. And um, yeah, 
for a trip like this, you need a different boat for each section if you're gonna, now you don't need a different boat, but going upstream, downstream, large lake whitewater, those all would require um, different things from your canoe. We had a Kevlar 17-4 Langford Prospector and um, it, it did the job. Neat. Yeah. Um, let's see, besides the granola bars, what food did you take? We made all of our meals, so we didn't have any sort of pre-made meals that you just add hot water to. And so in the morning, that would look like a lot of oatmeal and granola bars. And in for lunch, we do, and you know, we learned from Minogen. And so we would do basically everything we would do at camp. For lunch, you have a lot of pemmican and chocolate, and then you have like salami cheese and tortilla. And then for dinner, we would make pastas or rice. Um, yeah, but I talk about feeling a lack of nutrition near the end of the trip, especially because we resupplied on our fresh foods at the grocery store at Norway House, but a stray dog ate all of our food and we didn't even know until we were already a day away that we didn't have that anymore. And so we decided not to go back and we were basically living off of varieties of Bisquick for two weeks. <laughs> this is interesting. Yeah. Wow. Um, how about the bugs? Tell us about the bugs. I've repressed most of them, I think. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing how they with you, even on Lake Winnipeg, when you're, you can't see land in any direction and there are bugs in your boat. Um, but yeah, the worst was on the Etchamamish and Anne and I are very competitive. And this also means that we don't complain to each other. We, we always want to be the strong one. Um, and we were broken uh, by the bug on the Etchamamish where we were both, it was ridiculous. You know, our, our uh, rain jackets were super cinched. We're trying to eat soup outside. The bugs were attacking our face. And at one point, we just started screaming and ran into the tent. Um, yeah, so they they were bad in some points, but honestly, not as bad as as those farther north Arctic trips where the the black flies really get you. Take their pound of flesh. Yes. Uh, let's see. Um, can you tell us more about the process of writing your book? Um, did you know you were going to write a book or did you kind of, what was the reflection years later like? Yeah, so I didn't think I was going to write a book. I always feel like to write a book, you have to think you're an author. And I didn't think I was an author for a very long time. Um, I actually was giving a presentation at Midwest Mountaineering in Minneapolis and this guy showed up and he was wearing a St. Olaf sweatshirt and St. Olaf sweatpants and a St. Olaf hat and he was like, I went to St. Olaf too, but he graduated 50 years before I did and he was so excited about our trip, we became pen pals and I started writing him stories from our trip and, and mailing them to him. And after a while, I just started keeping all these stories. And then at some point I was like, I should write a book. And so I, it took me several years to realize that's what I wanted to do. And then it took me several years to write it while also working a full-time job. <laughs> I would imagine. The process was, it was really cool to be able to, I would talk to Anne and be like, I've been thinking about you all day because <laughs> I'm just reflecting on our relationship and this thing that we did. and. Um, and so it was really cool to relive that and also take what I've learned as someone who's been working in an environmental sector since then um, and sort of process things through, you know, where I'm at now versus when I was 22. Sure. That's a great segue into the next question. Um, just one of our viewers notes that it's so hard to see the systemic issues related to industrial agriculture. Um, do you see any reasons for hope or change or possible solutions? What has happened in the last 10 years? Yeah, um, it's that's a really, really big question. If I could answer it, I'd be everyone's favorite person. Um, I, I'm a communication scholar, and so I really focus on how we articulate the human nature relationship and how to even get to the point of industrial agriculture and using those chemicals that we use um, to grow food that people don't even eat that go to cows that can't even process them and so we need right like you start to see the connected systems and how um you know capitalist ideologies come into play when you view nature as a resource and so a lot of what 
I think is helpful is um, all these these movements and discourses now that are really focusing on um, viewing nature not as a resource or not even as something that's out there or separate from humans, but starting to um, understand that we are enmeshed in, in the world, that we also um, have a, a role to support life um, and, and, you know, mutually thrive with all these other beings in which we are you know, coexisting together. And so when you start to think about the world like that, and then you see um, direct harm to the landscape, uh, you start to feel <laughs> a little bit differently about these things that for a long time have just been totally normal to drive through the countryside and see nothing but corn. And you can trace, you know, why that happened and, you know, wars and chemicals and all of those things, but to, to actually feel the harm that's done um, and sort of like the guilt and the and the shame for the human species is um, I feel like where I'm at in terms of if reconceptualizing reconceptualizing my perceptions of our human nature relationships, which is not a direct answer to your question, but that's sort of my, my headspace is all around communication and articulation. Thanks for that. Well, one more question. I think it's a good one. Um, have you had your little one in a canoe yet? And where will you take her? have she went out for her first time two weeks ago and she did okay <laughs> she just stood in the middle and held on to the yoke so um we are going to go up to the boundary waters when i'm up for the book signing in july so that will be her first overnight i actually tried to camp with her in the backyard when she was about six weeks and that was also not successful <laughs> so you probably weren't sleeping anyway so yeah uh, yeah, so there there are lots of plans there to make her think that it's totally normal to do this type of stuff, and hopefully she will. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see if she likes it. I don't know. It is totally normal, but probably a good call not to come uh, June seventeenth when black flies are still out. So, speaking of which, Natalie will be at Stone Harbor Wilderness Supply on July seventeenth, um, and available. Uh, to uh, sign books and, and answer your questions and do a reading there. Um, and this presentation will be available on North Hess's website for a couple weeks here for you to view. Um, so if there's somebody you know who would like it, please feel free to share it with them. Natalie, we really appreciate your time and your story. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week for um, Brian Hansel on photography from Canoe and Kayaks next Thursday. All right. Good night, everyone.